to be blunt about it, we've been working as climate scientists for the last 15, 20 years trying to communicate climate change. And I think PowerPoint's wonderful. I think chalk is wonderful. But we've, we've, we've singularly failed to get the importance of this message across. So trying other mediums to, to communicate the issues and the severity of issues around climate change is, is what the purpose of today is. So uh, good morning um, and, uh, and welcome to you all, ladies and gentlemen, to, uh, to this um, Ways of Seeing Climate Change uh, session. This is an important event, perhaps a little experimental, but I think it's important for several reasons. Firstly, I doubt that many, or I don't know of any, uh, established scientists who would question the validity or the importance of climate change to the future of everybody on the planet. But we know it's highly complex, the messages have been mixed, and they are difficult to get across to non-scientists. So the purpose of this event, I think, is to see how uh, art can help us to communicate complex messages. Uh, the focus of today is climate change, but I actually think it's of value more broadly in science. Because I'm sorry to say to the scientists here, we are really not very good at explaining what we do in simple plain words that are accessible to people who don't understand the jargon we use. In terms of invisible dust, um, hopefully everybody knows by now what we do is we get artists and scientists together and we work on uh, climate change and environmental projects. Um, I set up Invisible Dust with a scientist uh, who's actually based at University of Anglia, um, a guy called Peter Brimblecombe. He's an atmospheric chemist. And when I first met him, I started talking to him about what he researches, which is air pollution. And when I said to him, how do you research air pollution because it's invisible? He said to me, I measure dust through time. And I thought, what an amazing thing for someone to do, to look at something so infinitely tiny and measure it through time. It just sounds like an art project. I was totally baffled by this. And so really, that's the start of um, Invisible Dust. This is the state which we've got into. Um, you know, the eyes glaze over now. We, do, we, we're, we are so used now to being assaulted, battered, uh, by facts and figures and, and if you like, the, the sort of that, that end of science. And it's very difficult to know uh, what to do about it. It's, it's like a different language, it's a foreign language, I think, sometimes that, that, the, uh, that people are using. Um, because the reality is we don't live in the rational world, um, and cold scientific facts and, uh, and, and figures are really not really on, on the agenda of most people. We demand truth and we demand facts, but frankly, when we get them, we tend to hide away from them. Um, so what do we do? We, I think we do respond to uh, stories, to human emotions. Uh, we respond to art, we, res we respond to poetry. And we're moved, we're moved by these things. And that's the whole point. Um, but we're not moved by science. We think about science, we accommodate it, but we're not moved by it. In other words, science in itself does not necessarily change us. It doesn't take us from one place to another. It tells us what is there. I always get told that my, my talks are doom and gloom. Um, that's probably the more upbeat parts of it. So I'm going to start off, I start turning the talks around. So I start off with the conclusion, which is a bit more positive. So um, here we have um, the conclusion from a, taken from a paper, which I was surprised got, it was a peer-reviewed paper by the Royal Society, or peer-reviewed by the Royal Society. Um, and they got through uh, this final statement, which I was very surprised by. This paper, this, this message on climate change is not a message of futility, but a wake-up call of where our rose-tinted spectacles have brought us. Real hope, if it is to arise at all, will do so from a bare assessment of the scale of the challenge that we now face. And I think that's probably where we've, as scientists, we've let the policymakers and the public down, is we have, we have not been open and honest about where we are in the emissions, particularly in the emissions side, that go along with the, with the climate change issues. Um, and I'm going to try and sketch that out a little bit here. But it's an upbeat message that if we are honest about where we are, and we are probably get to the point where we're on the cusp of almost leaving it too late, then we, we still have some opportunities to make some changes that could, that could deliver a climate resilient and livable future. Now to our hamstring curl. That's it. You've got it. The most important thing is to keep the system going. That's it, keep it moving now. Keep consuming all the time. That's what it's all about. Now let's pick up the pace. That's it. Let's get faster. Let's consume more and more and more and more. Let's do it now. Keep working it. Come on. Faster. Faster. Harder. Faster. Stronger. Better. Push it. Now to our half jack. 
So um, one of the things that I'm really fascinated about is how artists, scientists and citizens that are trying to make change happen can deal with these kind of quirks from which kind of culture emerges. So it's not necessarily about the carbon, but about the weird stuff that we do, like putting chicken in the fridge. I think Kevin touched on it, 20th century behaviours and we, we need to deal with uh, 21st century. So we need to foster this imagination that will lift us out of our, our kind of weird past and put us into our, a new future. And so I think this is the intersection that I'm really interested in exploring a little bit further. Now, I want you to all help me out here. I want you to do me a favour for about just a minute and a half. I want you all to put your hands here. And I want you to hold your breath when I say go. And when you can no longer hold your breath, you drop your hands. Okay? One, two, three. Go. Hold your breath. The reason why I did that is, is about what really matters. You know, it actually really matters to us. And I think the air that we breathe is, is the most important thing. You know, we put a lot of emphasis on having a great job, having a big house, having lots of money. But when you think about it, you know, what really matters is what we breathe. My proposition is that scientists have trouble communicating about climate change in part because they have trouble talking about some kinds of change, any kind of change. I don't think it's particularly their fault what I would say to you is science, when it comes to talking about change, people have very clear expectations. When scientists talk about change, it's expected that it's progressive, that they will say, look, we're going to have more understanding, um, and more understanding will give us more prediction, and more prediction will allow us to control it and give you more certainty. That's what we expect from science and always have, right from the beginning, right from the Renaissance onwards. Which means then it's very difficult, as a scientist, if you then stand up and say, well, look, we've made a huge breakthrough in the last 30 years, and the breakthrough is um, we now know that we will be able to predict certain aspects of our world less. And there will be uncertainties, which we thought once upon a time we'd just get rid of. Now we know they're going to be there forever. Um, so we probably can't control it as much as we used to think we could in the 70s. Science itself, I think, can enter a dialogue with arts because science has a wealth of wonderful theories and wonderful ideas which have a strong metaphorical strength to them, which can be used. We shouldn't worry too much about what's the best. You know, spend hours and hours or days and days or months and months analysing what's the best thing that we should do that we should really just get on and, and do it. And I think probably that was the take home message. There, there's plenty of things that we can be doing and that we should already be going out there and, and demonstrating that, that there are options for, for moving ourselves towards a, a, lower, a lower carbon, more sustainable society. Yes, I'm back on the deck. I see no movement, everyone still sleeping. Now that there's no need to run anymore, I wonder what we'll do. I mean, we all became runners. That's who we are. I just wonder. So we need to stop now? Okay. <clears throat> Three, two, 